happy that you are here with us. This afternoon, we'll be having three steps, three moments, okay? We'll start with uh, a short video, a very short video called Enrich by the Dialogue. Enrich by the Dialogue. And then after that, we'll listen to Dr. Shomali. He'll give us a brief talk. And then the third moment will be a moment of dialogue, okay? Question and answers, impressions, and whatever thing you, you feel to say during this moment. But before we start, I would like to say, it's a friend from, who has been journeying with us towards Universal Brotherhood for long. He knows the charism of the Focolare movement, the charism of unity that Chiara Lubick left. And Chiara used to say, the plan of God on humanity is unity, which means universal brotherhood. We don't do it without trying to know each other in a better way. We don't do it without making steps towards that unity together. And we feel that this afternoon is one of those moments where we are making a step towards that universal brotherhood. So without wasting more time, I will just ask the technical team maybe to start with the video. I, I say the, the title is Enrich by the Dialogue. It's a short video and then after we part, we'll go to the second moment. Thank you. The Focolari movement first established contact with Muslims in the Middle East in the late 1960s. In Algeria, deep friendships were formed between Christians and Muslims in the city of Clemson, giving rise to flourishing Focolari groups of Muslim brothers and sisters. In 1995, Cardinal William Keeler, Archbishop of Baltimore, introduced Kiara Lubick to his great friend Imam W.D. Muhammad, leader of the Society of African American Muslims. Shortly after that, Imam Muhammad invited Kiara to speak in the Malcolm X Mosque in Harlem, New York. This led to a pact between them to work unceasingly for peace and unity, which continues today through regular encounters between African-American Muslim communities and Focolari members all over the USA. In Britain too, over the last 20 years, Focolari has been enriched by its contact with people of many different faiths. In 2004, Chiara Lubick addressed a gathering in the Westminster Central Hall entitled What Future for a Multi-Ethnic, Multi-Religious, Multicultural Society? Our experience tells us that anyone who wants to move the mountains of hatred and violence today faces an enormous task. But what is impossible to millions of divided and isolated individuals becomes possible for those who have made mutual love, mutual understanding and unity the driving force of their lives. When we from different religions enter into dialogue with one another, when we open up to each other in a dialogue of human kindness, mutual esteem, respect and mercy, we are also open to God. We allow God to be present in our midst. And what better guarantee than the presence of God? What greater help for us in order to be instruments of fraternity and peace? In 2015, 
young people of the Folkalari and of the Islamic Unity Society held a joint weekend at the Folkalari Centre for Unity in Welling Garden City. Myself and other members of IUS, Islamic Unity Society, a Muslim youth group, um, charity based in London, Manchester, um, have come to meet and work with a great organisation that's the Fakala movement. Personally, I've learned that there, there exists so many people that still are so passionate about serving God and working for God and serving humanity. Instead of having interfaith where it's merely an understanding perspective, so I understand who you are, you understand who I am. It's interculturalism, whereby we say that I'm learning from you as you learn from me. This weekend I've spent time with people from all around the world um, and from different faiths and backgrounds and I've heard about how they um, how they live their lives and how they try to do good in their community. It's been fantastic this weekend to mix with Muslims and Christians, Anglicans, Catholics, a real mix of different people and just hear their stories and hear their um, thoughts on, on w the ways that we can dialogue successfully with other people. Um, opening your heart, opening your ears, listening, knowing when to talk and when not to and um, trying to focus on God, trying to focus on what's really important rather than on yourself you know trying to push the ego to the side and focus on what's important which is god with me in one in three one two three how did you do that And something that I've learned from experience is to try to be always ready to dialogue. So I don't have to wait to go to a formal meeting about interfaith activity. I can be ready to dialogue with um, whoever's next to me in the canteen. Um, I don't have to tell them I'm ready to dialogue with you. It's just about having an attitude of openness and looking for connections with people. So it might be no more than handing them a clean cup. Do you care? Do you care about multiculturalism? Do you care about dialogue? The characteristic of 2015 Regenerate meant that the answer was unresounding. The answer was, yes, we care. The Focolari movement has valued greatly the inspirational contribution made by Dr. Shamali at many of its events. In 2016 and 17, in Birmingham, London, Leeds and Glasgow, the Focolari has collaborated with Muslim brothers and sisters and together with them is committed to work for a more peaceful, more united world. Are you getting me? One, two, three. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was just a summary of what has been this journey with uh, the Muslim and the special way with Dr. Shomali and the, all the scholars who are accompanying him. But today we may have opportunity to know more about, uh, about that. We said with Dr. Shomali and uh, his friends, we no more call each other friends, but we say we are brothers because that's what we feel. Apart from having the same ancestor, eh? we are all sons and daughter of Abraham, of Isaac and of Jacob. We feel that God is calling us to move things around us. This is an opportunity. It should be also an eye opener for all of us here in the hall and those connected to look at the community around us. Maybe we can also do something. But before we, we come to that, I would like to invite here with me, Dr. Shumali himself. He's going to give us a brief talk. And then after that, we are going to dialogue, to talk, okay? So you are very welcome. 
please, can you clap where has he, has he come to, to meet me? Majority of those connected are those who live the spirituality of unity. But we know that you too, you feel like being a son of Kiara Lubik and uh, you have accepted to share with us your views, your life and whatever you know about this dialogue between Christians and Muslims. So we are eager to listen to you and uh, surely after that, people will have some questions to answer. So you're very welcome. Thank you. Peace be upon you, all who are here and all who are with us on Zoom. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful, I am very happy and delighted to have this opportunity to meet here and also with our Focolare uh, brothers and sisters and with our, some of our other Christian brothers and sisters and Muslim brothers and sisters. And it would be interesting if you at some point introduce uh, uh, people from different parts of the world that are with us. Uh, I think that our faith in God, if it is real and if it is in the way that God has expected from us, cannot bring except closeness to each other. Like when you have two lines coming from the center of a circle towards the, you know, uh, outer space, the more you go away from the center, the angle becomes, you know, wider and wider. When you go to the center, it becomes closer. Once we had a conference in, at the University of Oxford and a Christian friend asked, what do you think is the sign of progress in spirituality? I had asked him this question and then he t turned it back to me. So I said, there can be different signs, but in my understanding, if you make progress in spirituality, it means that you are getting closer to God. If you get closer to God, one outcome is you become more kind to people, more caring and loving for people. If your spirituality is just between you and God, and you don't bother about people, this is not a true spirituality. So a true spirituality should bring more love for people. And the second is that it should make prayer more and more precious for you. Because for a believer in God, nothing is better than having a chance to talk to God. And my idea is that when we pray, our prayer should be supported by our work. So if I ask God for knowledge or for, I don't know, uh, good income, etc., I should also act in that way. But the main thing that works is my prayer, not action. Is the action that making my prayer serious to God. If I pray and don't do anything. So a true faith is the one that makes you closer to God and people at the same time. There is no way to, to rise vertically. You have to rise vertically and also widen your heart 
horizontally. We find people in different traditions, whether it's in Islam or Christianity or some other faith. Normally, when they are more spiritual, when they are more uh, leaning towards God, they become more open. They become more tolerant, more caring, more charitable. So these are general things that everyone understands. But thanks to God, through my about 25 years of trying to explore people of other faiths, and especially uh, Christian brothers and sisters, and my relation with many Christians in different churches, and in particular with some groups, and in most particular way with Focolare, I have been able to witness that true faith in God is not measured by the doctrines that you believe in, by the rituals that you perform. One of the common you know, mistakes perhaps is, and I had myself this kind of understanding, and I'm not saying it's 100% wrong, but it's not complete, it's not adequate. And if you think this explains everything, this is a mistake. I used to think that when there is a person that shares with me the same doctrines, for example, I am a Shia Muslim, there is a Shia Muslim, he is closer to me. Then a non-Shia Muslim is in the second circle. And then a believer in God of Abraham, like Christians and Jews. And then people who believe in God, but maybe not from Abrahamic community, maybe they don't have our understanding of God. And then people of goodwill like this. So who are closer to me? In this understanding, the people who share with you more doctrines and more rituals. But later I thought this is not enough because true faith, as we said, is not based on what you believe only or what you do only. True faith, we said, it's a matter of your closeness to God and people, your openness to God, your submission to the truth. So in this understanding, who is closer to me? If I am a God-centered person, those who are God-centered, they are closer to me. So I can be a Shia Muslim and there is a Sunni Muslim who is deeply devoted to God. And there is a Shia who is not connected to God. Which ones are more closer to me? In the past, we used to think, or at least we were not maybe clear, that doctrines are not enough to judge. Maybe there is someone who is sharing with me my ideas, my practices. Maybe he's even a family member. But I see his life is just for the sake of, for example, worldly gain, you know, just for example, they want to have, you know, money, they want to have comfort in this world. But maybe there is a Sunni who is devoted to God. Or maybe there is a Christian who is devoted to God. So if I am truly faithful, I should not think who is closer to me based on the doctrines, based on the practices, let alone based on color, on language, on geography. A faithful should think, who is closer to my Lord? Who is trying to please him? Who is submitting himself also to the will of God? So 
This kind of understanding was supported by my experience of meeting people from other schools of Islam or from other religions, in particular Christians, that I could not close my eyes. I could not ignore the dedication that I see in them. And thanks to God, I had not such kind of upbringing or such kind of mindset that, you know, I was trying to close my eyes. Actually, I was trying to see work of God in other communities. So with our Fukulara brothers and sisters, I felt that there is something genuine here. And this was not something easy because I am a philosopher, I am a theologian, and I am hesitant to rush in my judgment. I have also responsibility of people who respect my idea. So I should not you know, rush and you know, get emotional. So what I did since about 97, I spent lots of time visiting Focolare houses, spending time attending Mariapolis. The first Mariapolis was in Lake District, maybe 97, 98 that I attended. And then others in Scotland, in, you know, again, Lake District, in Liverpool, etc. Then going to Rome, then going to Assisi, Padua, Perugia, all places, then outside Europe. Just this meeting reminded me of a meeting I had attended about, I don't know, it was 2005, six. I was in Toronto, and at that time there was a connection with Rome about family and with the late uh, Terry. You remember Terry, who passed away? So we were in a big little gathering like this. So I tried to explore more about Focolare and what, is, what was interesting for me was that they have managed to have a spirituality with community life together. Because some people are spiritual, but not able to practice it as a community. The third element which was interesting for me was that it was very international. Every house I went, I see maybe someone is Italian, someone is you know, African, someone is, I don't know, Filipino. So this was also very interesting. It's very international. Another thing which was very interesting was I noticed that this spirituality, which is collective and which is international, was also able to bring some realities on the ground. So, for example, you know, lots of projects in, under the economy of communion. It's easy, not easy to be a spiritual, but it's easier to be a spiritual, but have nothing to do, you know, with economy or, you know, uh, social justice, etc. And the fifth thing which was very important for me was that wherever I met Focolare, whether it was for days, for years, or just for hours, sometimes I met a Focolare maybe two hours. For example, in the US, I went to American Academy of Religion, one of Focolare was selling books. So for just, I saw her for two hours, but I felt they all resemble. They all show the same love and care. And this was for me very interesting that no matter which part of the world they are, no matter which you know, background they have, they all show same fragrance. And this is very important for me as a you know, teacher and educator. It's very important. It shows that how important is the formation and then later all the connections that are there to keep the same blood circulated. So I've been thinking about these things. And then along with that, I was thinking about some aspects of Islamic eschatology, 
we know that uh, for all Muslims, but more maybe importantly for the Shia Muslims, this world would not end without universal justice and peace being established. Even some narration says that even if one day is left, that is going to happen. So there's no doubt about it. And we know that our 12th Imam for the Shia Muslims or Mahdi for you know, Sunni Muslims, they don't, may not call him Imam, but they call him Al-Mahdi. He would come with Jesus. I was thinking, why Jesus? Why not Moses? Why not Abraham? Why not you know, any other prophet? Why just Jesus is coming with Imam Mahdi and they are going to work together? Doesn't this say something to me that this world is not going to gain to universal peace and justice unless Jesus and Imam Mahdi are together. This means that Muslims and Christians should be together. And we have to work towards that direction. And then lots of other verses of the Quran. I don't want to take your time. It all put me in this kind of thinking that first of all, I have to work for unity inside Shia community, inside Muslim community, inside Abrahamic faith with other people. We should build unity over unity. I remember once, you know, we had a panel with some of our Christian friends about Muslim Christian relations and a lady came afterwards and said, when you talk about unity of Muslims and Christians, I am afraid. I don't know which faith you know, she had or maybe no faith. I said, we don't get united against anyone. We just get united in order to actually reach out better. Our unity is not against. So, so I can work for unity inside my community and at the same time unity with all Muslims, unity with Abrahamic faith, any opportunity that we have for bringing people closer to each other, we should use. You don't need to work either for unity in family or unity in community, family, community, everything. So I have to work for unity. It's very natural then to think who are other people who work for unity and try to appreciate what they do, try to learn from their experiences and extend your hand to them for working together for unity. My conclusion was that our Fokulara brothers and sisters, they have managed to make a lake of unity. Every human being is like a drop of water. Okay. But when we get together, we become a lake. What can a drop of water do? Very little. But when you merge, when you have unity, then there is no limit in what you can do. Even I believe when we say man is made as image of God, I think it's man when united with others, not man which is divided. United humanity is better image of God than divided humanity. So I noticed that Focolare have managed to merge and become a lake. I as a Muslim acknowledge, appreciate, admire that thousands of men and women they could do lots of other things, but they devoted their lives to God and they try to live this spirituality of unity. This is what makes me grateful to God and to them. And also I saw some of the characteristics of people that are going to help Jesus and Imam Mahdi. For example, something which was very interesting for me is that we have in some narrations that helpers of Imam Mahdi are united in hearts. And 
And they are so close to each other that when you look at them, you think they are brought up by the same father and the same mother. And I had seen myself this. So in 2015, after long you know, years of uh, knowing Fukulara and being friend, I came this, to this conclusion, and I pray that this is going to happen, that God willing, this spirituality and these united men and women in Fukulare, they are going to play a great role for that ideal of universal fraternity to happen. It's a beautiful lake that is going to help but we need an ocean. Lake is not enough. How we are going to reach from lake to ocean? Maybe other lakes are going to take form and then they merge. Maybe this lake is going to grow and become an ocean. I don't know. But any person who is working for unity under God I must help, I must appreciate. And I should see how I can, in my little capacity, be a voice of unity, be a bridge for people to connect. So this has become now my you know, main philosophy of life. And I think this is my main mission. And I don't separate in any circumstances, I should try to bring unity. If there is a problem between husband and wife, we should bring unity. If there's a problem between parents and children, we should bring unity. It's a problem in community. Or if in the world, a scale problems, we should bring unity. And I think this is the only way to be truly monotheistic. So unity of God cannot remain something just in the air. Unity of God should be reflected in unity among human beings. God doesn't want us to be divided. Even God doesn't want us to go back to him separately. God wants us to go back to him together and pray to him together. Therefore, I think we should all try our best to be always a voice of unity, to bring people closer to each other and to not let differences which are there take us away from lots of opportunities for unity that we have. We should not make our commonalities and our differences just in two columns and count them and say, you know, we have 10 commonalities, we have 10 differences. Half of the glass is full, half of it is empty. No, this is not the way I understand. I say, we all believe in one God. Anything else is secondary. These differences have not the same value. If we are God-centered, the main thing is to find people who also try to serve God, to worship God, to follow the will of God. But how they show their submission to God, it can be different. Every person based on their own tradition, they do different rituals, they do different things, but the main thing is what? Submission to God. If I have all the rituals and all the doctrines, but I am not submissive to God, what value it has? So if we find people that are submissive to God in any religious tradition, we should appreciate and say, this is great reason for unity. What can be greater than sharing the same God? I don't think there can be anything greater than this. If 
this is another way of putting this. And I'm finishing now so that we can have more questions and comments. If God is not able to unite us, what else is going to unite us? There's nothing greater than God. What are the differences that some people may think they are greater than God so that they keep us divided? It's impossible, you know, to have anything greater than God that we say, okay, because of them, having one God cannot unite us. And I think this is a real understanding of unity of God. Unity of God is not that what is, God is one and there are other objects. Unity of God means that God is one and there is nothing next to God, nothing comparable to him, nothing like to him. Anything else is under God. Anything else is secondary. God is the main thing. We keep our differences. We keep our identity. But we don't let these differences and identity make us forget that we have one God. So I thank God for, first of all, showing himself to us and finding our hearts valuable to love him and love his people. And also, I especially thank him for giving us such understanding of faith that has led to love, to unity, and not to dislike, not to division, not to separation, not to confrontation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shomali. Uh, here in Kenya, we say to, to say we are very happy for what you have said. We said, uh, Piga Makofi, it is what they have just done. So putting their hands together, clapping for you, is a sign that they do appreciate and they thank, thank you. you for what you have just said. In fact, the more you speak, the more I feel that we are, how close we are to each other. But I should not be the one speaking here because before we start, I saw that people were connected from Uganda, from Angola, from Zambia, from Togo, different parts of Kenya, and uh, Carlo Toros, that some are uh, connected also from Italy and from Scotland. Before we, the floor will be given to them to ask their questions. But before then, let me repeat a bit, a few words that you said, no? Sure. Those were, that touched me personally. You said, our faith in God can only bring us close to each other. That was a point. And then you said, true spirituality should bring more love to the people around us, I think. True faith in God is about your submission to the will of God. And you said in the Fukulare, they have managed to create a lake of unity, but we need an ocean of unity. A lake is not enough. That was an invitation to all of us sitting here and those connected to look at what is happening around us and to see how we can contribute to make this universal fraternity become a reality. Now, before you conclude that you said, there is nothing greater than God to unite us. So now, please, I'm inviting those here in the hall and those connected, somebody may help me to read the questions on the chat from those who are connected on Zoom. You, the floor is open, please feel free. You raise your hand and uh, I don't know, uh, the technical team, somebody can help me read a question if there's already a question on, okay, thank you. So we are getting the first question now. If you can also tell us who is asking the question. You can, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, we, are, a bit louder. Uh, we are receiving slowly, slowly, but we, we can start from the whole. Ah, okay, start we can start from the whole. Eh? Okay, so if there is any question here in the hall, the question is welcome. 
The microphone is yours. Okay. Uh, we really appreciate your speech. Uh, that was very beneficial for us. One question is in my is in my mind that says, okay, bringing others to unity is a good option, is a good and mandatory for us. But when it comes to those who are not following this path, how should we behave them? I mean, how should we treat with them? How should we, you know, have a peaceful life with them? Is it any possible way for us to bring them to our, I mean, side or not? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I can mention two points. One is that I think for every person, at least there is something with which you can establish a good relation. Even it can be a common concern. For example, you know, now we have you know, concern about ecology, about environment. Maybe this is an area that we can work together. And I think any of these issues which are genuine, which are real, are all leading us towards God. If you work for ecology, we are getting closer to God. Maybe people don't realize, but this is moving towards God. Maybe we work on family, how to strengthen institution of family. And again, this is something towards God. So with every person, we can find something. Maybe the only people with them, we cannot find anything to unite are those people who have lost their humanity. People who are, you know, so corrupt and, you know, like, you know, serious murderers and, you know, killers, or, you know, this kind of people. Maybe they don't want to, you know, do anything, you know, in common. But any person of goodwill, we can find something. The second point is that if believers in God, they manage to unite, the attraction of faith becomes much more. Because many people unfortunately think that faithful people cannot get together or they are cause of problems. Religion, you know, some people think if we get rid of religions, then we will have no problem in the world. This is not true, but this is propaganda. They want to put all the blames on religious people. And therefore, some people are not just atheists. They are fundamentalists in atheism. So they want to eradicate any sign of faith. To the opposite, if we work together and show how much our faith has helped us in our own personal life, community life, and also across borders, our faith has united us and has enabled us to work together for charitable causes, for things that humanity needs. This kind of thing would be very attractive to people who may not be faithful. If they see Muslims, Christians, you know, are working together shoulder by shoulder, then they see how interesting it is that despite all their differences, Love for God has united them and has made them humble and kind to serve human beings. So they want to try to test. So this is the second point. Thank you very much. Yeah. In fact, what you said reminds me of what Kara used to say. That the unity that we portray will attract more than the speech that we, that, that, that we make. So you are saying exactly the same thing. Okay. Now, I will still invite the people on the chat, yeah. those who are connected, to write their questions on the chat and yes. somebody will read. It seems there is a question now. C can you hear me? Yes. Okay. We, we have one request. Yes, sir. Okay. Hello? Hello? Yes, you, you can talk. Yeah, yes, I'm... Um, um, uh, Ustaz uh, Adam uh, Sabiara from Uganda. 
And uh, th thank you. We can hear you, Dr. please. Ishimani. Maybe you have to open. Okay, it's okay now. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Shomali, a, a great scholar, a, a writer, and we've been reading much of your writings. And um, uh, what, what you, you have delivered to us is not different, actually, from the impression we get from your writings. Um, it's an impression that I got that has strengthened uh, my, my thinking that um, in Islam, uh, we are from God. Uh, we should be with God so that we return to God. Uh, we are for God and to him we should return. Um, so you, you cannot return to God when you are not with God. To be with God, Ma Allah, is, is what um, is referred to in um, Christian terminology as Emmanuel, uh, being with God. If you are with God, um, though from him, you are, you, are with God, you are not with God here now, then we shall not return to him. Um, so you cannot be with God when you are, you are not giving peace to everybody, to everybody, like God gives peace to all the universe. Even God's the, um, 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 made a decision to destroy Lucifer. Lucifer he, he is his opponent, but he, he leaves him to continue living. So this is, if we copy that one, because God with his, all his power cannot, has not decided to, to, to destroy Lucifer, Shaitan. So uh, you are different from me. We can live together just like God leaves his opponent to continue living like that devil. Uh, so we should do, uh, be sympathetic uh, to others, although we are different in faith. That, that's the impression I got from uh, the, uh, the uh, doctor. And uh, we, if we, we move with God, we are um, you know, close to each other, although we are different religions, where then we shall get that to that perfection. And perfection is what we are looking for. And it is uh, what is meant by paradise. This is the uh, total pleasure. You live at peace with others, although you are different. Thank you, uh, doctor. I'm Adam. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, if uh, I understood well, uh, so your idea is that if we are with God, then certainly we will work for peace and unity. Um, it was a confirmation of what we discussed. And I agree. Thank you very much. I think any person who is a man or woman of God can only bring light to this world, only bring peace, hope, and uh, therefore be a voice for unity. Thank you very much. We have established uh, more an impression than a question. He was also in Tangaza course for three weeks and he's now connected from Uganda. We appreciate. We have a question uh, to Dr. Shomali. How do you deal with the challenges posed by your own brothers and sisters from Muslim community who may not agree with you about the issues of Focolare movement? Thanks from Karen Nairobi. From where? From Karen Nairobi. Nairobi. Cairo. Karen. Is, is... Ah, Karen. Yes. Uh, I think people may find it difficult to uh, accept what I say unless they know me well and you know they trust me. Uh, but even if they trust me before they see themselves, maybe they think I am, you know, exaggerating or whatever. This is why I try to, you know, uh, help many people go to Maria Police Center, you know, uh, for example, here or in Lopiano or Monte, we go together and also in their own cities, we try, you know, to put them in touch. In the last about for five years, we have had uh, many people who have at least been to one of these places, and many of our people have been to two, three places. Uh, so they see by themselves that this is the reality. 
And I think uh, many people, especially in our community, they are very much ready to accept this because they are very open and they are trained in the way that it's not difficult to explain these things to them. If people are properly educated Islamically, I think they would find this easy to accept. Just they may not be sure about whether this case is, for example, you know, genuine or not, they need to see, or they need to ask someone who knows. So I try to introduce uh, Focolare movement. Normally, any place I you know, talk about Muslim-Christian relation, I mention at least once, twice, sometimes, many times, uh, Focolare friends, because I think people should know. And I think God has uh, gifted not only you, God has gifted humanity with this spirituality and this charisma. And we need to introduce to people and uh, little by little more people are becoming aware. And it's also important that if they are inspired to try something for unity in their own tradition. So I sometimes say, you know, start wherever you are with few people, establish unity among yourself, and then God brings more opportunities to you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Another question. Yes. Dialogue is fundamental, but sometimes it feels passive and only engages those who are willing to listen and understand. Is there a more active way of reaching out to people, especially those who are more radical? Yes. Dialogue is, I think, a very natural choice for human beings. Human beings should always be communicating. Uh, in logic, when we define human beings, you know, in Arabic, we say, hayvan al natiq We say an animal that speaks. <laughs> and then they explain that this speaking is not just speaking, means thinking and speaking, you know, like logos. So I think there is a co connection between logos and communication. If we didn't have logos, we could not communicate. And if you stop communicating, our logos goes into decline. So it's very natural for us to talk. So talking to each other is not waste of time, but it might not be enough. This is why we say, you know, from talking to each other, we should establish unity and then work as a team. But we should never think dialogue is waste of time because if we don't have dialogue, then little by little problems start. You know, Islamically we say, you, if you have you know, issue with someone, you cannot stop speaking more than three days. It shouldn't be four days. Because if you don't talk to each other, the problems just expand. If husband and wife don't talk to each other, the second day is worse and more difficult to go back. The fourth day is more difficult. If you don't speak for one month, it's very difficult to go back. So dialogue is very good, but we should go towards unity and share our thoughts, share our resources, and just see what God wants from us as a team and do it. The rest is up to him. For us, it's not, I think, uh, a kind of task or a kind of expectation that we solve all the problems of the world. We have two tasks. One is not to be part of the problem of the world. <laughs> the second is do your part. The rest is up to God. You know, I, If I think about all the problems of the world, I get despaired. I have to make sure that I don't add to the problem. And second, I do whatever I can. And I am sure God blesses sincere efforts. So if we work together, we can you know, bring lots of positivities and God also is going to help because we have also this idea. We say, 
Yadullah ma'al jama'a. Hand of God is with united people. If you are united, hand of God is above you. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Yeah. For the next question, uh, Mauricio, if you can say something that help us identify who is asking the question, the country, the name, I suppose each and everyone has his name written as yes. those who are connected. The we'll be the... we'll be happy to know where the questions are coming from. Thank you. Yes, the one was from Chelsea. And uh, now um, uh, there is a request of a talk, Leoncio. Okay. Uh, thank you, doctor and uh, viewers of uh, tonight's uh, beautiful call. Uh, I'm a, a Catholic priest in Uganda, and uh, I live the spirituality of the of unity. It's uh, a joy, a deep joy, again, again, after our studies to know that uh, a universal peace and justice will come, both in the Islamic and also Christian religion. Uh, I am uh, a human rights adv advocate. So this question comes from this uh, angle of human rights. Uh, someone asked questions similar to this, but uh, I would like to direct this to the, since, Catholic, since uh, Christians and Muslims have got common destiny, how could we together dialogue with the state, the states at that position, politicians in particular, they are the greatest stakeholders for human rights in the world. They are leaders of states, they are heads of governments, they are heads of countries where all religions live. How can Christians, Muslims with the common goal dialogue with our states, dialogue with our governments? Because some Christian governments and also some Muslims governments, they, are, they, they, they have this difficulty of uh, respecting the value, the dignity, the liberty, the equality of human persons. How could this, uh, I want to respect and beautifully recognize this very conference going on. Could we in this conference have a, a position that to refer, we can refer to, that we can together dialogue with our governments better. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think the question was how we can have dialogue with the states and governments. Yes, that's yeah. it. Yeah. I think uh, dialogue has no limit and we should have dialogue with any human being. Even I believe we should have dialogue with the nature when you go next to a flower, try to have a dialogue and see what the flower is trying to tell you. Everything has a way to show the beauty of God and to you know, communicate to us. So we have to train ourselves uh, to be attentive to every creature, every creature of God. So when it comes to human beings, certainly it's obvious that we should have dialogue and with the state, with the politicians, uh, we should have dialogue. But again here, if we are united, we can have better dialogue. Otherwise, they may think we have our own sectarian or, you know, our own religious, you know, selfishness, and we want always something for ourselves. Or they may not bother about us because they think they can you know, keep us divided and then they do whatever they want, some of them. But if there is unity and with unity, we present a case which is not for one particular group, it's for all of us, then I think they will hear us better. But we need also to be patient. We shouldn't, you know, 
quickly feel despair that maybe, you know, I tried twice, three times, it didn't work, but try it four times, five times, you know, with patience. We have to be persistent. Uh, so I don't find any case that if we are united, the chance of success does not increase. I think always chance of success with unity increases. Thank you, doctor. I would You're like welcome. to to remind us that we started, we're having 28 points of connection. Now I'm seeing 37 points. The audience is increasing. And I'll still remind those who are to ask a question to introduce themselves well so that we know from where they are really talking, please. Yes. Is there any other person? Who... Yes, the, um, there is a reaction from Adam Sebiala who, in, who talked before. Yes. Just uh, I mentioned, uh, to, the, to disagree with the reality of unity is just a temporary short-sightedness. <laughs> unity is a reality more understood by those who have tried violence. The refugees from Middle East to Europe understand the value of unity and peace than others. Radicalism is unsustainable. And after a time, those isolated pockets of radicalism should lose the appetite. So to disagree with unity is a temporary short-sightedness. Yeah. But because then, to disagree with unity yes. is a temporary short-sightedness because mm. the reality will tell you the difference, the, yeah. the, the opposite. Yeah. Maybe we get another question from the hall, if there is any. Uh, Mauricio, yes, we, we there, take is, a question a, from there the is a hall. question of Professor Mbai. Wait, wait, from the hall first. Ah, from Professor Mbai will come okay. later. Dr. Shamani, thank you for what you said. That no. was wonderful. My name is Robbie. I'm here at Mariapolis Piero. Um, my question concerns the relationship between faith and reason. There was a survey done in American universities among young people who say they don't believe in God. And the biggest percentage of responses to that question, the biggest percentage of answers was, they said, because science has proved that God does not exist, okay? So there is that view of science, reason, with its own methods, et cetera, et cetera, and that faith is just some sort of a silly, uh, childish belief in, in a God and okay. So obviously that is a very, you could say, uh, weak, understanding of the relationship between faith and reason. In the, in the Christian tradition, uh, for many centuries, there has been a reflection on the relationship between faith and reason. In, the, in your own tradition, in the Shia tradition, is, is there, uh, has there been a process of reflection on the relationship between faith and reason? And how do you think, what is the importance of this reflection in relation to this contemporary situation where we have many people who make, let's say, a, a rather immature, we might say, mm. comparison between faith and reason. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a very good question. Actually, our second round of Catholic Shia Dialogue in 2005 was on faith and reason. And then with our Catholic friends, we published uh, this volume and it's Faith and Reason in Theory and Practice. So it's a collection of papers from Catholic side and Shia side about faith and reason. Our understanding uh, uh, is very similar to the Catholic understanding. Uh, we believe that reason is a very important uh, way of understanding the truth. And we believe that reason not only is not in conflict with revelation, indeed reason invites us towards faith. And then reason also inside faith helps us to understand faith. Because uh, there's a 
nice point one of the contemporary scholars said. He said, some people think reason is like a kind of, for example, key. You open the door and enter religion. But he says, this is not good analogy. Why? Because then when you are inside, you don't need the key. But we are in need of reason, even inside faith. Otherwise, we come up with, you know, funny understandings of faith if you don't use reason. Reason is like a torch that helps us to find true faith and then explore inside and then switch on the light of revelation <laughs> so that revelation then will help us better understand many things. Uh, in Shia tradition, we believe that every person should accept faith based on reason. I cannot say I am a Muslim because my father was a Muslim or, you know, I have to have my own reasoning. I have to be able to show that I am convinced that this is true. And therefore, for us, studying logic and philosophy are very important. So in Shiite seminaries, you know, we study logic and philosophy in addition to theology, jurisprudence, and Quranic studies. So there is complete harmony. Our seventh Imam, Imam of uh, Shia Muslims, Imam Qadim alayhi salam, says, God has two kinds of ways to communicating his will. Apart from what is in our conscience, there are two additional ways. One is through prophets and messengers, through revelation. One is through our reason. Our reason is external way, so, sorry, internal way. Prophets are external. And then some people have said, prophets are reason brought out. And reason is a prophet insight. So we have maximum respect for reason. But reason is different from personal guessing or opinions. You know, it has to be really decisive judgment by reason. Because some people, you know, say, I think like this, I believe like this, I guess like this. It's not reason. Reason means it has to be going a step by step through logic. Thank you, Doctor. Very inspiring, this analogy between the reason and the torch that help us to find the switch to revelation. Yeah. Very inspiring. Please, can we get now the question from yes. Professor Mbai, and then after we'll come back to the hall. Eh? Yes, Justin Mbai from Nairobi. Thank you, Dr. Shomali, for this, for this great sharing. How can we ensure that our dialogue and unity does not lead to religious syncretism or amalgamation of faiths. So, to amalgamation of faith. Like mixing up. Mixing, yes, mix up. Yeah. This is a very good question. Uh, like other questions we had so far, very good questions. Uh, as I said, we need to keep our identities. We are not saying that we mix Islam with Christianity and then make a third thing. <laughs> then the problem increases because now we have you know, three groups of people. <laughs> one believe in Islam, one believe in Christianity, another in the mix of Islam. No. We say these differences are there. We can talk about them. Like, for example, now there are issues that some Sunnis and Shias talk about, some issues that Catholics and Lutherans talk about each other. Maybe it takes some time, they can come to some agreement, but till you have been convinced that this point in theology, for example, should be you know, re-understood or revisited, we have to keep what we have. We, but of course, we are always open to the truth. We are always you know, discovering. We don't close our mind. But so far, the best understanding that we have of the truth is our tradition. Okay? So we need to keep this. 
and build the unity upon this, not take away the identities and distinctive features and make unity. It's like, for example, um, if we want unity between husband and wife, it's not that husband forgets that he's a man and wife forgets that she's a woman and say, so, you know, you have to be something in between so that you can be united. No, it's distinctiveness of each of them which contributes to unity. So the example which uh, came to my mind uh, in University of Palermo was this example. Uh, I said, you know, like organs of body. Heart is different from kidney. Kidney is different from liver. Liver is different from eyes. Eyes are different from ears. Each are different. If heart gets confused and thinks that I am kidney, and the kidney thinks I am heart, then they cannot function. They have to keep their identity. But all of them should know that there is only one way to remain alive, and that is if they connect and support each other. Yeah? So if heart says, you know, I don't bother about the rest of the body, I don't want to unite with you, then cannot survive, and the rest of the body also cannot survive. So identity, distinctiveness helps in establishing unity. Thank you, Doctor. We get a question from the floor here now. Thank you very much, Thank yeah, you, Mr. Ali, uh, for sharing your ideas and theory on unity and some personal experiences you had in this way. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, you know that in the contemporary age, we see different types of duality, sectarianism and eschism. Uh, and I'm really interested to know that, uh, based on your idea, what's the main obstacle uh, to reach the mentioned goal, and what's the solution? Main obstacle for? Uh, for this kind of uh, sectarianism, and uh, main obstacle for solving the ah, problem of... To overcome. Uh, yeah, sectarianism and reaching the unity which you mentioned. I guess it's another good question and yes. maybe better answer is coming. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. First, I think we have different kinds of ego. Sometimes ego is personal and therefore it's an obstacle for a person to reach out and to connect to other individuals. But sometimes ego can be a religious ego. Sometimes can be a sectarian ego. You think it's not ego because you think, you know, I am trying to promote my faith. I am trying to promote my, you know, community. But in reality, you are promoting yourself and you are covering your ego by using names which are sacred. For example, I want my church or my mosque to be the best in this region. And you think this is for the sake of God because I am improving the church or mosque, you know? But this is not for the sake of God necessarily. Because if you were not in this church, you didn't want this. <laughs> the reason you want to improve this one is because you are here. And if you were going to another one, then you wanted to that one. Sometimes, unfortunately, people, and actually many times, people who have not eradicated ego altogether, their ego takes different shapes and forms and come on their way and becomes an obstacle. We need as servants of God to really work on our, you know, motivations and our intentions and not let ego get especially into religious. Because if ego comes to your busyness, it's a problem. If it, ego comes to your family, it's a problem. But if ego comes to religion, it's tragedy. 
Because religion has so much of power that if we bring ego to religion, it can cause misery to many people. Unfortunately, sometimes people with reference to religion did things that if they were not religious, they were not able to do it because they think I'm doing this for the sake of God. Not knowing that they are doing for the sake of themselves, that they are using the power of religion. Mm. So we have to work on our humility, on our sincerity as well. So this work for unity is in need of theological reflections, spiritual reflections, meeting, discussing, lots of things should work together so that there is no blockage in our mind or heart. Mm. Otherwise, we cannot work for unity. Working for unity, in a sense, is very difficult. Because unless you are pure, you cannot work for unity 100%. Mm. Maybe you unite with someone, but then cause problem for other people. You have to be very pure and selfless so that you can really work for unity. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. I think we really need to be out of ourselves to be able to work for unity. Yes. We have to be out of ourselves. <laughs> I would not like, would not like to abuse on your patience. Uh, we know that we have been connected for some time. We may take two more questions, one from the floor and one from those who are connected online. Uh, I don't know if there is you somebody can... online who has a question. Mauricio, if not, we start with a question here in the hall. Yes, you can continue with the floor. Okay, Father Ade, you have a question. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. You're welcome. And uh, that's a very exciting experience, this discussion. Uh, I would like to uh, ask a question concerning um, Christian, Muslim dialogue and uh, diplomacy. Diplomacy with the society, diplomacy with governments. What can you say in this direction? Because I think this is an area that really needs to be developed. I think God has his own diplomats. <laughs> A diplomat who works for God should work for all nations. I remember once we had a, uh, you know, second person in, from one of the Western embassies visiting us in Qom. And Iran's political relation was not, you know, that you know, good with that country. But I said, I think you as a diplomat are serving our nation and your nation because you are the one that if there is anyone to defend the interests of our people and show, for example, greatness of our culture, etc., is someone like you who has been here and living with people here. So a good diplomat, a, a diplomat that is a diplomat of God, Maybe he is from one nation, belongs to a nation, but it's a diplomat for all nations. And does not work for glory of any country or any sect or religion with the cost of lowering down others. A diplomat of God maybe has more concern about a particular group or cause, but wants all people to succeed. A diplomat of God is able to use language, 
and tools that bring love and unity. Would never, you know, endorse war or sanctions or boycotting because these are not things that work in God's diplomacy. God never, you know, puts sanctions on people or, you know, uh, attacks people, you know, or sends troops to destroy a nation. All the nations are to be respected. All human beings uh, are respected to the extent that the Quran says if you kill one person, innocent person is like killing all human beings. And if you save one person, is like saving all human beings. So every child on this planet is a sacred creature of God. And I cannot only think about children of my family or my country. So if we had, you know, real uh, kind of uh, United Nations, because this is not United Nations, really. We, we have a long time to reach United Nations. This is a good platform that states are meeting each other and talking to each other. I don't think how much, I don't know how much unity is there, but even if there is unity, it's just between the governments, which is not unity really. But if we really had a godly platform that all the nations could be represented and with unity, with brotherhood, talk about challenges of the world. That would be, you know, great. So we need to work more on this beautiful idea that you mentioned about, you know, uh, kind of divine diplomacy. Thank you, doctor. You're From welcome. your answer, I think I will always pray to be a diplomat of God. Yes. You want it? I say, I will always pray to be a uh -huh. to remain a diplomat of God <laughs> from the way you have explained it. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of requests. I, I mentioned one story. Uh, many years ago, when I was in Qom, uh, we had a group from Gregorian University. They visited our institute in Qom. And I went to see them up to the you know, gates. Then one of them said, uh, we are waiting for new Iran's ambassador to Vatican because Iran has two ambassadors in Italy, one to the state of Italy, one is to Vatican. So they, he said, we are waiting for the new one. And he said, maybe you should become ambassador of Iran to Vatican. And I said, I am already an ambassador. He was surprised. <laughs> I said, I am ambassador of God for all nations. <laughs> And this is, I think, uh, uh, something that is more honorable than being ambassador of one country. Oh, yes, it's bigger. We want to serve all nations. You know, once uh, uh, I was in Canada and there was a picture and was a flag of Canada also behind. Then someone said, you know, why you took picture with the flag of Canada? I said, I can take picture with flag of uh, other country. It's not that, you know, I am forgetting my own country, but these are Canadian people and I respect their flag and I can take pictures. So we should not let these things limit us. We should look for opportunities to reach out. Thank you. Mauricio, yes. so the two questions online will be the two last questions, then we'll conclude because uh, our visitors, our guests, they also have another program after this. We have to respect, we try to respect them to, to the best we can. Yeah. So please, can you give us the questions? We give the word to Marilene uh, from Cameroon, who is currently in Nairobi. Good afternoon to everyone and many thanks, Dr. Shumali. Good afternoon. As I wrote, it's not a question, but an impression. I've been so impressed by your various responses to the questions. Above all, also the first presentation in talking on our closeness with God. One joy uh, confirmation that came uh, to my heart is that I am one passionate about peace education and its promotion, which as we all know, 
uh, uh, the cube through the cube of love to promote the cube of love as the cube of peace in the field of education because from my own life and also in the experience with my students some years back in Cameroon, I realized that it's a tool which breaks down all barriers. But in working on a project uh, on applying in the area of education, in the area of peace, I, I felt that the cube I had or some of which I know, I felt something needed to be adapted to our reality in Africa. Uh, since there, the word Jesus could not come in. But I had felt it is good not to work alone, but to work with my other friends who are also passionate about it, who do already live it in schools, but I know in other parts of the world. And last week, it was so, it was really a great joy for me that connecting with one of my friends, one of our sisters in Tanzania, and asking how she lives it in school. Uh, actually, she promotes it in her class. And she told me, it goes, it's going very well. And she added, where there is Jesus, she put um, God, that is to see the presence of God in every person. So it was a big joy for me, I felt, that is the kind of word, that is what I needed, because in our African context, you cannot completely uh, not put the context of, uh, I mean, God in this uh, reality, which is something that we all believe in. So the more you spoke of, the more I, I, I saw it really as the, the answer to something I had been, I, which, uh, I felt it's necessary to be part of that cube of peace. There is uh, the one in, used in many parts of the world where you cannot talk of God, but our reality here is different, which I felt was something uh, to come in. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. May God bless you. You told me they did that for respect of the others who are of other religions. So as you spoke, I saw that it is really the point. Thank you. Blessed are the peacemakers. <laughs> Thank you, Marilene, for that experience of making the peace of love more universal. Uh, the second. Yes, now we give the word, uh, the word again to Leoncio from Uganda. Leoncio, we are listening to you. Yes. Uh, Okay, thank you, doctor and members again. Uh, yes, I asked a question about uh, religion and uh, the state. Uh, with my experience uh, of leadership and uh, from uh, a war experience community for two decades, I, I bring this question again, close to the first one. There are three important institutions in the community in Africa, maybe also in other continents. Religion, the state, and culture. And for the peace of the community, there are people who believe and follow their leaders depending on where they belong, could be religious, could be political, could be cultural. So in the context of religion, in the prayer of Jesus, Father, may they all be one. We have witnessed again and again when political leaders, cultural leaders, religious leaders are united, there is the peace. So I have realized that uh, we have not yet brought uh, cultural leadership in my question, I've not yet brought in the earlier ones. Could this call, could this conference become an opportunity that uh, bring, unite religious, cultural, and uh, political leaders together for the peace of the, of the world? How could we do this, dear doctor? 
So what? So if I understood the question, you were asking if this conference could be the call to put together religious leaders and political leaders. Is that true? what you were asking briefly to say? Political, cultural, and, and religious. Three. Together. Together. Yeah. yeah. So previous one was about government and now it's with culture as well. Yes, of course, as I said, there is no limit for dialogue and for unity. We have to certainly work on the culture and all the factors that you know affect the culture. For example, we talk about peace, but the games that children have and spend hours on these games, many of them are not you know in favor of peace. They are in favor of you know killing and you know demolition, etc. And you get credit if you can you know destroy better. You don't get credit if you help poor people. You don't get credit if you build peace. Uh, so we have to work on all these things. And I don't know why, you know, this issue of games is not receiving enough attention. Because it makes a child think that murder is simple. They, because it's very difficult for a child to make distinction between what is real, what is not real. When they see something on the game, on the internet, then they think real life is also like that. So uh, our sister talked about peace education. And one of the areas that they have to work on is to talk about these games have to be uh, revisited and have to be changed. Unfortunately, many times, just because of making money, they make these games and, you know, uh, it's very destructive. We should make uh, games for unity. Yeah. <laughs> games for unity, exactly, exactly. Yes. At this John show, I think we would like to thank all of you, those here in the hall and those who are connected for being available and participating to this conference this uh, afternoon. Uh, we will thank in a special way our technical team who made it possible for us to be talking to each other from Uganda, from Zambia, from Angola, wherever, and being able to listen and to see each other. But in the special thanks of course goes to Dr. Shumali wow. for his commitment for this interreligious dialogue, for being available to us today. You know, I knew the spirituality of unity, I was 12 years. So I grew up on it. And when I came to understand what it was all about, I started to believe that unity was going to be made. Unity of the world was going to be made in the next two years. I, it was my belief. I was living and believing. And I think it was part of what helped me grow also in faith. So my take home message today is remain close to God because when you are close to him, then you are close to other faithful and together with other faithful, you can show to the world that unity is possible. Mm -hmm. We would like to thank you in a special way for what you, 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 you've said. We hope this was just a beginning of something that is going to... Today with technology, even if you are in Iran, if there is need, we'll say, doctor, can we connect and have another step ahead mm -hmm. towards that universal fraternity, because I call these steps towards universal fraternity. So thank you. Thanks to all of us thank who you. are here. And, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, you And thanks to those <laughs> the cabin. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>